Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Adam Scher, Vice President for Collections and Exhibitions at the Virginia Museum of History and Culture. Welcome again to another at-home edition of our Banner Lecture Series. Uh, so glad that you're with us today for what I think is going to be uh, a very uh, informative discussion. Uh, first of all, thank you all uh, for being members, for helping to make these programs possible. Uh, we, we could not do this without your support. Uh, and so that is deeply appreciated. Today's lecture uh, is Rebellious Passage, the Creole Revolt and America's Coastal Slave Trade. In October 1841, a ship named the Creole left Richmond with 137 enslaved people bound for New Orleans. It arrived five weeks later, minus the captain, one passenger, and most of the captives. Nineteen rebels had seized the slave ship and steered it to the British Bahamas, where the enslaved men, women, and children gained their liberty. Rebellious Passage is the first comprehensive history of the ship's re uh, revolt, its consequences, and its relevance to global modern slavery. And we're very happy to have with us today the author of the, the book, Dr. Jeffrey Kerr Ritchie. Uh, Dr. Ritchie is a, a native of London. He received degrees both in Great Britain and in the United States. Uh, he is currently the professor of history and director of graduate studies at Howard University in Washington, D.C. His research interests include slavery, abolition, and post-emancipation societies, especially in North America and the Caribbean during the 19th century. Dr. Kerr Ritchie believes that history is an argument without end and that students are best attracted to its study when the educator exudes a love of learning and we couldn't agree more. So please welcome Dr. Jeffrey Kerr Ritchie. Thank you, uh, Adam, for those um, introductory uh, remarks. Uh, I'd also like to thank uh, Graham uh, Dosia at uh, the museum for uh, both the invitation and also assistance in putting together this talk, uh, which originally was uh, planned uh, to be uh, in person, but of course through uh, through events over which we have no control. Um, it's currently uh, being streamed. I, um, I'm going to talk for about 35 to 40 minutes um, and then hopefully we'll have a dialogue um, and some of you will put out some questions because I think that's very, very useful. Um, I cannot promise that my comments uh, are going to be as uh, exciting and as titillating as the, uh, the future speakers on um, Virginian uh, bedchamber habits. However, I shall try to uh, engage you uh, with... Um, a very important uh, historical event and why uh, we should care about it. So Graham, if we can start the, um, the PowerPoint and can we go to the uh, first slide? I want to begin with the historical event uh, and this comes from document one. Uh, it's Alexander Cockburn's letter to the British Foreign Secretary, Lord Aberdeen. It's dated November the 17th, 1841. And I found it in the Aberdeen Papers in the British Library uh, in London. Next slide, please. This is the, uh, the letter. Um, I know it's a little difficult to read, um, but um, I'll try and make some sense of it um, for you. On the top right hand uh, corner, you can see 277 Ford Bahamas. That is a description of the, uh, the page and the, uh, the ledger uh, out of which the, uh, this, this letter uh, comes from. Um, the address uh, of the, uh, the sender, Government House, the Bahamas, November the 17th, um, eight, 1841. And uh, it reads as follows. My Lord, I have here been placed in a situation of some difficulty and delicacy by the arrival in the port of NASA of an American brig, the Creole, with 135 slaves on board 
who it appeared had risen on the crew. And after murdering one white man, a passenger, and badly wounding the master, the first mate, and others, had taken people, had taken possession of the, the vessel. So you can imagine the British Foreign Secretary in London waking up in the morning, going to his office and being uh, going through his correspondence and being confronted with this, this letter. Can we go to the next uh, slide, please? Bah Bahamian Governor Cockburn's letter raises some interesting questions. What was this ship doing? What was this American ship doing in the Bahamas? What was the British colonial government's response? What happened to the rebels and the captives on the Creole? Why is this ship, why is this slave ship revolt uh, significant? And what I want to do in the next 30 odd minutes is to give my remarks framed around answering these questions. Next slide, please. Let me say, uh, let's begin with uh, a couple of words about the abolition of the United States uh, slave trade. According to two important um, uh, secondary sources, one by Philip Curtin's book in 1969 on the Atlantic slave trade and the Voyages database out of Emory University in Atlanta, anywhere between 348,000 to 253,000 Africans arrived in British North America slash the United States between 1700 and 1807. In 1787, as part of uh, building a new nation, of course, we've got the US Constitution, uh, which essentially uh, includes a bundle of compromises over the slave trade and slavery. That is because northern states, for northern states, slavery was politically and economically far less important than for southern states. One of these compromises was a law banning interference by Congress with the slave trade for 20 years, up until 1808. On March the 2nd, 1807, uh, 19 years later, the United States Congress passed an act of abolition essentially banning the participation of American citizens in trading Africans in the Atlantic slave trade. Section nine of that 1807 act read as follows. Section nine required every ship, quote, sailing coastwise, this is language from the act itself, with slaves provide, quote, duplicate manifests, end of quote, of the ship's cargo of slaves co-signed by captain and port collector. The major reason for this, of course, was because of a concern that slaves would continue to be imported into the United States in the Atlantic slave trade. So ships found with slaves on board had to prove that they were engaged in another type of business, not a transatlantic uh, a business. Next slide, please. Thousands of these ship manifests lay in federal archives awaiting scholarly analysis. I thought what we'd do is go through uh, one of them as an example of many of these thousands of, uh, of documents. This is the ship manifest for the Creole, March the 10th, 1841. This is several months before the um, the fated, uh, fateful journey that we're really going to be talking about mostly today. Um, and it comes, it's located in Record Group 36 uh, in the National Archives and Record Administration on, on uh, Pennsylvania Avenue. Can we go to the next slide, please? This is a, uh, a copy of the, of the manifest. Um, and at the top, it reads, Manifest of Slaves Intended to be Transported on Board the brig Creole of Richmond, Virginia, whereof Robert Ensor, master of the burden, 187 tons, that's the uh, the tonnage of the ship, the Creole, and bound 
for the Port of Richmond, state of Virginia, for the Port of New Orleans in the state of Louisiana, this, 18th, this 10th day of March, 1841. And then what you'll see is on the right-hand side, you'll see columns, and those columns, I'll, I'll briefly identify the names, and then moving to the right, sex, age, stature, height, color, the shipper, the shipper's residence, and uh, the consignee, the person who's going to receive the captives, and the residence of the consignee. And then going back to the left-hand side, we have 15 uh, captives. We have their, their names there, just to identify two in particular. Um, number two is Edward Jackson. Uh, Edward was 20 years old, five foot six, described as black. Number 11 was Lucinda Green, a female, 22, five foot three, and described as yellow. Staying on the left-hand side of the page, the captain of the ship, Robert Ensor, basically signs an affidavit confirming that these slaves were not brought from Africa. And in the bottom left, you can see, you might barely be able to see the, the signature of Thomas Nelson. He was the port collector uh, employed in Richmond to ensure that this ship was not engaged in the Atlantic slave trade. And Robert Ensor signs it. And then if you turn over to the right-hand side, uh, you'll see it countersigned by Bernard um, Hurt, who was the port collector in New Orleans. And that's dated 9th of April, 1841. So basically, the Creole's taking about a month to get from Richmond to, uh, to New Orleans. Next slide, please. Um, I want to look at very briefly at the um, the the the, uh, the root of the of the Creole, and this is document number three, and it's in the book Rebellious Passage, um, because this will give you some sense of the coastal routes that a lot of these hundreds of these coastal ships um, made. Uh, next, next slide, please. And um, here you can see uh, via the arrow the. Um, historical journey of the Creole uh, in late eight, in the fall of 1841. October the 25th, 1841, the Creole left Port of Richmond uh, in Virginia. Three days later, it stopped at Norfolk where it boarded more captives. Then it turned southward, staying largely toward the coast, a few hundred miles off the coast. And on November the 7th, 1841, uh, that was the date of the slave rebellion, um, after which the uh, slaves steered the ship, the Creole, to Abaco Island and the Bahamas. Um, and on November the 9th, 1841, two days after the rebellion, the Creole entered Nassau Harbor. Ten days later, on November the uh, 19th, uh, the Creole left the Bahamas and arrived December the 2nd, 1841, uh, in New Orleans, minus its captain um, with some, uh, together with some uh, injured uh, crewmen and the vast majority of, of, of its captives. Next slide, please. Broadening it out um, and looking at the extent of the United States coastal slave trade, hundreds of coastal slavers transported captives between the upper and lower southern states along this maritime path, which I sketched for the Creole. I estimate based upon historical published secondary sources and primary sources, more than 50,000 captives were moved in the American coastal slave trade legally between 1808 and 1864. The trade was officially abolished uh, by Republican Congress uh, and Republican president um, in late 1864 as part of the sort of transformation of the American Civil War from a war to a war against slavery. But an interesting comparison here uh, is with the illegal 
movement of, of, uh, of slaves in the Atlantic slave trade. Uh, it's estimated that about 51,000 slaves were illegally imported into the United States after the abolition of the American slave trade, um, uh, Atlantic slave trade, I should say, uh, in 1800, uh, 1808. And those are interesting uh, 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 figures, certainly um, contrasting uh, uh, ones. The thing, though, they have in common is I think both are underestimates. I think there were both more than 50,000 um, captives moved in the U.S. Coastal Passage, and I'll say more about that in the Q&A if you like, um, as well as there were more than 51,000 um, enslaved people moved uh, in the Atlantic slave trade illegally to the United States. The important historical um, event, though, uh, in terms of the, uh, the coastal slave trade is we see the expansion of the U.S. empire of slavery. Slaves were being moved from the Upper South and its declining economy around tobacco and wheat into this sort of burgeoning new economy around sugar and especially uh, uh, cotton. And you see the movement of these enslaved people from the Upper South uh, to the low, uh, low, uh, Lower South. And that sort of process of relocating coerced labor, agricultural production, the agricultural production of, ca of lucrative cash crops, and the demand from both new textile mills in New England, as well as the massive demand of old textile mills in old England, especially Lancashire in the north of England, really played a critical role in the expansion of what I'm calling this US empire of slavery. Next slide, please. At the same time that the US empire of slavery was expanding, the British empire was expanding its colonial abolition. In 1833, the British officially abolished their colonial slavery. They had abolished their slave trade and British citizens' participation in the Atlantic slave trade in 1807, um, largely as a consequence of a massive um, uh, uh, and successful protest movement. Some people argue it's the first um, um, civil rights uh, movement in modern history. Um, the major reason for this 1833 Act, uh, however, Abolition Act, um, was a combination of a tumultuous times in British politics during the early 1830s, as a lot of people were calling for reform and the ending of an old British um, uh, slave-based um, system of production and political power, etc. But also in the Caribbean, the advent of a massive slave rebellion in Jamaica. Um, between December 1831 and um, January uh, 1832, some 60,000 enslaved Jamaicans participated in this slave rebellion read, uh, led by a deacon of the Baptist church, Sam Sharp, um, in what became the largest slave revolt in British um, colonial uh, history. And what it clearly um, made evident was that the existing system of masters and slaves in the British Caribbean was unworkable as a colonial um, uh, a process, and that change uh, needed to be made in the Caribbean. Um, it's a complicated period, but and we won't go, we don't have time to go through it. But several years later, in 1838, abolition was the Abolition Act was finally passed, which legally ended slavery in the British West Indies. Uh, and made the Caribbean colonies free soil and surrounding seas uh, free, uh, free waters. Next slide, please. This legal process was tremendously important because it transformed the relationship between Britain and the United States. In the past, United States slave states and British colonial uh, slave shores existed side by side because they were both engaged in the business of slavery. But with the passage 
of British colonial abolition, this now meant that slave shores in the United States faced free shores in the Northern Caribbean. And according to British Foreign Secretary Lord Aberdeen in a, in a letter to Special Envoy Lord Ashburton, who was in Washington for some business to sort of try and uh, solve some major issues between the United States and Great Britain, including the Creole Revolt, um, these British shores, quote, form so many decoys for any American slaves, end, end of quote. And in the book, I talk of several examples of slave ships which move or transport captives from the upper south to the lower south but actually never arrive because they're taking that route a uh, route that we are uh, that we um that we looked at uh and in the process either through slave rebellion or through hurricanes and bad weather uh ended up in the british uh, west indies and of course after the abolition of slave legal abolition in eight, beginning 1833 um these ships would would make it to New Orleans or Mobile, Alabama, but minus their uh, um, their um, their slave cargo. And according to Lord Aberdeen, this quote was a new state of things which existed between the United States and um, and Great Britain. Next slide, please. After the rebellion, um, the Creole uh, went to the Bahamas where um, there was the possibility of freedom. Some people have asked me in the past, well, how did, the, you know, how did these rebels know that, um, that they were gonna get their freedom in, uh, in, in the British West Indies? Well, as I said earlier, uh, over the last decade, um, American slave ships, uh, which had left um, Richmond and Baltimore, um, full of slave cargoes and arrived in southern uh, uh, ports in the deep south um, without their slave cargo. And this got reported uh, in the press. It got discussed in political circles at the state and federal level and also by word of mouth. And it's quite clear, uh, I argue in the book, that the rebels were cognizant of this information. And whilst they were not guaranteed that they would get their liberation, um, by going into the, uh, the Car British Caribbean, I think that they were risking it and sort of saying, okay, here's a possibility. If we can get the ship out of American waters into British waters, there's a good possibility that we get, a get our freedom because of these other cases that we've uh, heard of. The Creole arrives with the rebels and former American slaves more and un was essentially moored in Nasa Harbor uh, in the Bahamas um, subsequently, there's a dispute between the U.S. consul, a guy by the name of John Bacon. Uh, the United States had consul agents in ports around the world, um, largely to facilitate commercial relations, but also to expand American um, uh, soft power, but also to be there for when um, situations arose uh, involving American interests. And this was one of them. And so we have this dispute between the consul uh, uh, John Bacon and the British colonial officials uh, headed by Governor Blackburn, uh, Cockburn, excuse me, over what to do about these rebels and also these former American slaves. The British, after some lengthy negotiations, um, decide not to intervene. Uh, and those are their orders from, from London. And they left it up to the, the captives, the slaves themselves, to decide what to do. Should they stay on the ship or should they leave the ship? What happens uh, is that these um, former American slaves walk off the ship into uh, waiting boats. These boats manned by local Bahamians um, who took them ashore where these former American slaves registered as new British colonial subjects. And I just want to pull back a second and you know, get you to imagine what this uh, scene was like. And this is based upon reports by the US consul, um, Bacon, also British colonial uh, dispatches, uh, etc. The Creole moored in, which was moored in Nassau Harbor in early November, 1841, was surrounded by hundreds of small boats manned by Bahamians. And these Bahamians were armed with guns, with cutlasses, 
with knives. And the scene that you get is of a ship, an American ship, which was not being allowed to leave the port because of all these surrounding ships. It just couldn't, it, it, it couldn't work its way uh, uh, through them. And I think this is a, a, a very, um, a, a very important for understanding the nature of freedom for these former American slaves. Next slide, please. And I articulate this argument on a uh, page uh, on, in the preface of the book Rebellious Passage. It, Rebellious Passage, argues that contrary to the view depicted by biased contemporary accounts and repeated uncritically by most scholars, freedom was an opportunity that was acted upon rather than the gift of the British authorities. It further, the book further maintains that the liberation uh, emanated from the creation of a racial bond between former slaves and black Bahamians recently emancipated by British colonial law, 1833. In other words, the act of liberation represented a diasporic connection in which freedom was a shared struggle. So what I'm trying to argue here is unlike so many other accounts of the Creole, because it's a, it's a well-known story, but it's not been written about, certainly not been researched uh, um, thoroughly until this book. What they overwhelmingly argue is the British gave these um, uh, captives their freedom. And I argue to the contrary, they did not. It's the rebels who bring the ship to the Bahamas in the belief that they might be able to get their freedom. It's the, um, the former American captives who decide when given a choice to leave the ship rather than stay uh, uh, on the ship. And, that their, and, and third, their decision was facilitated by the support and solidarity that they got from these um, uh, black Bahamians uh, in, uh, in early November, 1841. Next slide, please. What happened to the 19 rebels? Were well, they were initially put under arrest aboard the Creole um, and interestingly enough, they were guarded by um, a company of soldiers, the second British West Indian Regiment, uh, which had a white lieutenant, but the soldiers themselves, uh, 20 odd soldiers were black. And these were former slaves who had been promised their freedom by the British in exchange for fighting for the uh, uh, enlisting in the British, uh, uh, British Army. There are some reports, especially uh, in the complaints by the US Consul that there was too much fraternizing going on between these uh, members of the second West Indian regiment and the former American captives, not the rebels uh, who were incarcerated in, in, in the ship, but um, the, uh, the former American uh, slaves. Um, the rebels were subsequently moved ashore and imprisoned um, in, a, um, in a building which is now a public library. Um, I was there several years ago and I've reproduced a, a picture of it in the book. It's a, beautiful building it looks like a sort of a, a small um lighthouse it's it's uh, painted bright pink with uh with green shutters on it and framed by a, a beautiful blue sky in the Baha that one gets in the bahamas um but what's interesting is the bottom um there's a a chamber at the bottom of the library and it's underground and it's still called the dungeon and my belief is the dungeon was the place where these rebels uh, were kept. In April 1842, several months after the rebellion occurred, the court of the British Court of Admiralty in NASA, the Bahamas, ruled that an act of piracy had not been committed and that the rebels were, quote, discharged uh, accordingly. One rebel had died in jail, uh, basically, and another had died uh, during the uh, the rebellion, and that left 17 survivors from the original 19 uh, rebels. Next slide, please. Where did the rebels and former U.S. slaves go? Some spread across the uh, the uh, archipelago of the Bahamas, and for those of you who are unaware, this is a massive uh, space. The Bahamas consists of over 700 uh, islands, uh, caves, uh, inlets, etc. It encompasses an ocean area of over 180,000 square miles. So it's uh, it, it's um, it's pretty massive. 
Others um, from the Creole went to uh, Jamaica. Um, I tried to find them there um, in the course of doing research for the book, but I couldn't locate them, unfortunately. Um, but it's quite clear that these captives from the Creole scattered for freedom and security. And I mean that in two, two ways. Firstly, I think they scattered to avoid the possibility of being captured by um, uh, the US uh, authorities who might be brave enough to try and send a ship um, to get them. Um, but they also sought, um, I think, um, to be outside the sort of official uh, gaze of the British colonial uh, estate. So that for them, freedom was sort of getting away from, from, from all of these um, potentially uh, difficult um, um, authorities. Next slide, please. After becoming free, um, what to do with that freedom? I talk a lot about the meaning of freedom, what some of these uh, Creole, um, um, former Creole uh, people did. Uh, but just to give you one example of freedom's meaning to one in particular, and this is document four. This is Elijah Morris's land deed, um, and it's for Gambia Village, the Bahamas. It's dated August the 15th, 1879, and I found it in the Registers General's Department. And if we can go to it, please. And as you can see, um, on the top right-hand corner, number 225, that is the number of the deed. It's a large book of property deeds, and there are lots of these books. And then you've got the seal at the top of the Bahama Islands. And essentially, you might be able to make it out. You've got here um, the name of Elijah uh, Morris. And then it's followed by, it's obviously a, a, a standard form, which then gets filled in by the person who wants to buy uh, the, um, uh, the property. And what follows in the, the handwriting is essentially um, a description of the lots two and three, which Elijah Morris is seeking to um, uh, register uh, at, the, um, at this, uh, this official uh, office. And um, he does so on uh, that day, August the 15th, 1879. Um, and it costs him uh, three pounds, two shillings and 10 pence, which in uh, today's currency is about 320 pounds, which is about just over 400 bucks. Um, and the really interesting thing about Elijah Morris was Elijah Morris was one of the four rebel leaders um, in the revolt, born in Virginia, we don't know where, but 20, according to the ship manifest for November of 1841, was 21 or 22 when the uh, the revolt occurred. So obviously he's in his 50s when he's registering this, uh, this property. So for Elijah Morris, freedom, the meaning of freedom wasn't just gaining liberty from being someone else's property, but it also meant gaining some landed property in order to be an independent farmer and uh, and cultivator. And indeed, when I was in the Bahamas several years ago doing research for this book, um, I encountered uh, some of his relatives who are still living in the village of Gambia outside of NASA uh, to this day. Next um, slide. Let me say a couple of words about uh, uh, gender here. Um, all the rebels were male but there was evidence of female slaves restraining crew members during the revolt. There were 57 women on board the Creole in November of 1841, according to the manifest, they chose to walk to freedom. The exception were four women and one nine-year-old um, a boy, a son of one of the women who decided to stay aboard and they ended up on um, going to New Orleans on the Creole. Those were the only five captives that were found on the Creole when it, um, when it um, went into um, uh, New Orleans Harbor on December the 2nd, 1841. Why remain aboard is almost an impossible uh, question to answer. All we can do is uh, speculate. Was it because of fear of retribution 
that uh, made these uh, folks um, decide to stay on board? Was it that they were being moved to join other relatives um, in the Deep South? We don't know, but I think what's really important is we do not misread or impose our own interpretation of this action as somehow a judgment of these people. Rather, I think it's more useful to look as an indication of the difficulties that existed. I mean, the movement or gaining freedom was never, never easy in a slave society. Uh, next uh, slide, please. I'm calling this Lucy Cheatham's luck, and it's quite interesting. It's document five, and it comes from John Hagen's uh, will. Uh, and um, it's, um, it's dated June 1856, and it's from the wills and probate records in Louisiana. Um, can we go to this document, please? Okay. Um, Difficult to see, but don't worry. The important point is uh, the following. John Hagen was a Louisianan uh, who was very wealthy. He was a cotton factor. He was a bank investor. And also, he was a slave trader. For example, he I found records in Louisiana of him moving trading slaves from Virginia and Maryland to Louisiana throughout the 1830s. In 1841, on that fateful Creole trip, he actually had he was moving nine captives from Richmond to New Orleans. They never arrived. They ended up um, getting uh, their freedom in NASA. Actually, one of those sort of ironies. <laughs> Uh, American uh, sort of with documentation is I found an insurance policy that Hagen took out for his nine um, his nine captives and I looked at the date and while he was signing that insurance contract um, in early November um, of eighteen forty one these captives were enjoying their freedom in the Bahamas unbeknownst to John Hagen who was unaware that you know. <laughs> That there have been this, this rebellion on this uh, this ship. So um, this is the last will of, uh, of Hagen. And what's interesting about it is that he talks about his relationship with Lucy Cheatham, who was a um, was a, um, a, a a woman that he had bought, and he ended up having some uh, relations uh, with her. They had two children. Um, Dolly and uh, William mentioned uh, in this uh, this will, and in his last will and testament, he says that um, they are to be granted their uh, their freedom, and not only that, they were to receive ten thousand uh, dollars, uh, which in today's money um, is and ten thousand uh, dollars, and each child was to receive a maintenance of five thousand dollars. Uh, which in today's uh, currency is about $156,000. Uh, 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 and when he dies in 1856, um, uh, Lucy Cheatham often, she stays in their home. It's a very large, expensive home uh, in New Orleans. And she would often sign herself uh, Lucy, uh, Lucy Hagen. Um, the reason why I call this lucky is because it's important to remember that for the vast majority of enslaved women, um, who ended up uh, in the uh, U.S. coastal trade. Um, they were never as, as fortunate as her. Next, um, two more um, um, slides and we'll be finished. Next one, please. What are some of the broader ripples of, uh, of, this, um, of this rebellion? Well, first of all, I think ship revolts are important um, because they give us an example of people acting as historical agents, which is an important sort of contrast to the more common idea that they were only victims. Yes, they were victims, but also some of them rebelled and resisted. And we should, you know, uh, acknowledge uh, that. A second important point, I think, is that these types of of slave ship revolts indicate the making of Pan-Africans Pan or a sort of a, uh, 
um, racial uh, commonalities as you have former American slaves um, acting with black Bahamians, um, soldiers from the Second West Indian Regiment, etc., all around the issue of of liberation. And I think pan pan African or the ship um, in these revolts plays a critical role in the construction of these sort of common racial identities. The third point I would make is that we've got proximities here, which is, and they're spatial and temporal. The spatial proximities, of course, are the United States shores, uh, the South Atlantic, and the North Caribbean, Northern Caribbean. But also we've got these temporal proximities. Things change after the British abolish uh, the slave trade, and they are unintended consequences. The British are not abolishing the slave trade in order to encourage slaves to rebel on American slave ships, but that's a sort of consequence of their action, and it makes for a fascinating story. Let me conclude with the significance of the um, next um, next slide, please. Thank you. Um, this, what is the sig significance of uh, the Creole uh, and this U.S. Uh, coastal slave passage? Why should we bother about this 170 plus years later? Well, first of all, it's a uh, remarkable uh, historical event. Uh, event. Slaves rebel, they seize the ship, they steer it to another, uh, another place and they gain their liberty and many of them disappear from historical record. I think the second reason why it's significant is it reveals the maritime dimensions of American slave trading after 1808. I should imagine that most members of the audience, um, when they think of the Atlantic slave trade and its abolition, they think that ends American part, uh, citizens' participation in the slave trade and the federal state support of that. That is not the case. It just switches from the Atlantic to these coastal uh, regions. Thirdly, it's bottom up. It's a very good example of bottom up history. What do we mean by that? Essentially, ordinary men, women, and children are acting in such a way that not only does it get the attention of the authorities in Richmond, as well as the you know merchants and slave traders in Richmond, as well as in New Orleans, but it even is keeping the corridors of power busy in Washington, as well as London. Finally, I think this, uh, this story of freedom's proximity is a very useful example of history as a transnational process. This type of story makes no sense if you're just doing United States history. It doesn't really make sense if you're just doing um, a British history, or if for that matter, you're just doing Caribbean or maybe even Bahamian history, because what it does is it occupies this sort of, these edges, right, of nationalist narrative histories. And it's in that sort of, those interconnections, those interstices, which you find this sort of, this fascinating material, and it's why I'm drawn to it. Um, and if we can end with a shameless plug of my um, <laughs> of the book, um, and I go. I encourage you for those of you who are interested. Um, please, uh, please buy it. And um, thank you very much. Thanks very much, Jeffrey. Absolutely fascinating. Uh, and I hope people will have an opportunity now to log in and ask questions uh, of Dr. Kerberichi on Facebook or YouTube. Uh, also. If you're interested in purchasing uh, a signed copy of, of Dr. Karushi's book uh, from the VMHC, you can go to our, our virtual museum store. That's www.shopvirginiahistory.org. Um, many questions come to mind. Uh, one that, that somewhat relates to the, the final portion of your talk uh, is uh, my understanding, and you can certainly correct me because I might not be correct, that this was the largest such uh, 
revolt uh, on a slave ship, uh, given the numbers uh, that were involved. Uh, so it, it no doubt made its way to the U.S. Uh, press. And I'm, I'm curious whether uh, you, you've compiled information about how the American public responded to the news. Yes, yeah, so in, uh, in chapter, uh, it's, it's, I believe it's chapter nine, I talk about the ways in which the Creole revolt um, was interpreted by different portions of the American um, uh, public. Abolitionists, um, Whig uh, politicians uh, like Joshua Giddings uh, seized on the, um, the revolt as an example of people pursuing freedom and tied it to this sort of this ideology of um, natural rights of, uh, of liberty and try to make it part of this sort of broader um, abolitionist campaign. Of course, the abolition movement has, you know, is now at this period, 1841, into its second decade of organization. It's small, but it's, 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 it's noisy. Um, in contra, you have American Southern slaveholders, you had Northern supporters of Southern slavery, and those who are dedicated to the principle of property rights as being um, dominant, they protest not only the actions, but also the fact that these rebels are not being prosecuted for killing an American citizen. Uh, and they're also furious at the British government's refusal to extradite these. Um, these rebels. But it goes much further than that, because uh, in that chapter, I also look at the British press's um, view of the uh, of the rebellion. And no one's uh, no one's looked at this before. And it's quite interesting, because um, I looked at dozens of newspaper articles in the, in the local British press. This isn't the Times of London. Uh, it was not a London based press. This is the the regional press uh, in, in Britain. And the vast majority of them are in support of the abolitionists' point of view and are quite critical of this sort of argument of property and the rights of man. And what you get is a sort of almost a newspaper war over questions of sovereignty, right? Um, so yeah, uh, it's quite a, uh, uh, quite a, um, a spectacle. But I would argue not as great as that caused by the uh, by the Amistad. So you mentioned at the beginning of your talk that you felt that they were uh, probably greatly uh, greater numbers uh, that were transported both legally and illegally uh, over fifty thousand. I wonder whether you could expand a bit on that. So. Um, we are never going to know the illegal numbers in the um, in the United States slave trade um, because they're illegal, <laughs> right? Um, you know, you it's it sort of uh, in great contrast to the Voyages database, which sort of obviously counts these forty one thousand uh, ships um, logs, uh, and the information has been put in statistical form. Um, you can't do that for the illegal uh, illegal ships, and I, you know, I encourage scholars uh, to continue to look for that. But I have to say that um, whilst they're busy trying to come up with this number, there are two other things that they should be looking at. One of them is the role that American slave ships play in moving slaves from Africa to Cuba and Brazil in the nineteenth century. They don't come to the United States. And many of them are ship captains from New England. And in fact, I've just uh, had a, one of my PhD students at Howard University uh, wrote her dissertation on this subject. It's actually quite fascinating. To the point, it becomes so um, marked that the um, that the U.S. consul in Rio de Janeiro in Brazil 
writes this sweeping set of, of papers condemning the role of American ship captains in transporting Africans from Africa to Brazil. So that's one area where we have evidence and a lot more research needs to be done on it. And really the two places to look at are um, the transportation of slaves to, to Cuba and also to, to Africa by American uh, ship captains. But then the, the second area, of course, is this area. Um, the number that I give, uh, is, as I say, is based upon uh, looking at as much material as I could, and the sources are in the book. But I can tell you it's clearly an undercount. Um, and what's nice is there is a project underfoot to look at the intra-American slave trade which is to actually go into these federal repositories. And they're all over the place. They're not in Washington, DC, which you would expect. They're in Atlanta, they're in Texas, they're in uh, Alabama, Mobile, and they're in New Orleans. And what you have to do is you have to unearth these manifests, and then you have to go through every one, that one that we looked at, right, for the 15, yeah? That's the way you assemble this stuff. So that's the work that needs to be done in the future. So you, you mentioned uh, Elijah Morris, uh, and, and I think that most people will agree that one of the things that makes history really compelling and engaging is when we we dig deeper into into the personal stories of, of people who were involved in these these sweeping events. And um, wonder whether you would talk a little bit about Madison Washington, who, uh, for those who don't know, was one of the uh, uh, enslaved or persons that, that led the revolt and uh, became, uh, I guess, either you would say famous or infamous uh, for, for having a novella written about about this event and about him in particular uh, by Frederick Douglass later. And, but uh, yeah. there's some, some great connections there between his, his life and, and Virginia. There are. And one of the things I hope comes out of this book is um, a desire, as a professional historian, I want to correct um, a mistaken interpretation of the past. Madison Washington has been seen as the head of the Creole Revolt since 1842, largely due to an article published by the Liberator newspaper uh, under Garrison's editorship, which is why so many people as associate the Creole um, Revolt with Madison Washington. The problem, however, is if you look at the records, if you look at the British... Um, colonial correspondence, if you look at the American um, uh, correspondence, if you look at newspapers, if you look, most importantly, at all of the documents assembled for a lawsuit uh, against the, um, um, uh, uh, the uh, well, a lawsuit, and this is the subject of chapter 10, it's a long chapter, um, adjudicated in the Louisiana Supreme Court in 1845, if you, and that's a 250-page uh, document and quite detailed. And There is no evidence of Madison Washington being singled out as the leader. Instead, what you have over and over and over again <laughs> is the identification of four people, one of whom is Elijah Morris, the second is uh, Dr. Ruffin. Uh, the third escapes me. And the fourth is Madison Washington. And it's these four who are identified over and over again in the documents as being the heads of, um, the, um, of, this, uh, of this rebellion. But you know, um, I, and I know that that doesn't go down well for, with certain people in Virginia because I remember, <laughs> I think it was a year or so ago, I was approached to review a marker, a state marker for this rebellion in Richmond. And it had been put up by people who were clearly invested in the proposition that Madison Washington was the head of the uh, of this rebellion. And I pointed out that my book actually argues otherwise. And I proposed an alternative, but apparently that was not accepted. So, <laughs> but you know what, that's fine. Um, I think it's great that there's going to be, uh, I don't know if it's been put up yet, uh, and maybe you know yourself, but um, I think it's an important event. There should be a marker uh, uh, to it. But I think Madison Washington's role in the Creole event, the Creole Revolt, and his um, 
relationship with uh, an enslaved woman who was purportedly on the ship, um, and we don't know that at all, um, makes for a great movie. Uh, and I'm all for that. And, uh, you know, I'll write the script. But, uh, <laughs> but in terms of sort of the historical record, uh, it's not quite accurate. So, uh, well, I guess then that begs the question, were there, were there any other great discoveries that you made in the course of researching the book that uh, flipped the script, if we will, on, on this narrative? Things that uh, people had assumed were true for so long, but you found evidence to the contrary. I don't think, um, apart from uh, flipping the script on, um, on Madison uh, Washington as the single leader, and replacing it with these four, and, and also trying to look at rebellion as a collective act as opposed to the identification of it as, you know, something led by an individual, which I think is a very popular way of looking at the past and rebellions, but I'm much more interested in rebellions as collective acts of protest and resistance. Um, I would say that uh, not really. Instead, precisely because it, it, it this um, event has been described and referred to constantly, but not researched. What I think is more illuminating and what comes from the book are these pearls of research, which are not changing the interpretation because the interpretations are not really out there, but rather things that you discover. So for example, during the, um, the slave revolt, what's really interesting is uh, a number of the rebels refused to harm some of the white sailors, which I find really quite interesting, right? This is not what you would expect in a slave ship revolt. Another example, and I referred to it, was Lucy Cheatham. I mean, I think that's absolutely fascinating. You know, a woman who's enslaved and part of uh, this uh, coastal trade ends up sort of in a, some type of relationship, we don't know what, some type of relationship with, with Hagen. They have two children and Hagen cares enough about these children as well as this sort of um, uh, uh, Cheatham to, you know, care for them after after his uh, his death. Those sorts of things I find really quite uh, 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 quite um, uh, remarkable. And again, looking at the looking at the um, the British colonial records, it became quite clear. Um, when I was in London doing research for the book, that um, the British government seemed to have next to no particular interest in um, advocating, promoting, supporting the abolition of slavery <laughs> of the slave trade. This is something they, they're not really talking about. I think instead what they're, uh, uh, because their concerns are, um, their relationship with the United States, the most powerful political and economic uh, agent of obviously in the Americas. And there's this huge textile, um, cotton textile sort of connection um, between the two. But I was quite, uh, I was quite interested, like, I was quite sort of struck by that, the sort of the disconnect between the sort of the humanitarianism, which the British government espouses, and these personal um, uh, messages which seem to be <laughs> much more concerned with real politic. Fascinating. So I understand you have another book project underway. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yes, I think that um, one of the things that strikes me is really interesting about um, the 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 Creole revolt and not only why it happens, but what happens diplomatically and politically around it and the consequences was this sort of this issue here of proximity and specifically and it's spatial and temporal proximity right which is to say and the question is what happens to slaves and slavery when free borders juxtapose slave borders right now, most people, when they think of that, they think in the United States, they think of the Ohio River, right? <laughs> uh, yeah, and free northern states, um, uh, southern states in the upper south, Kentucky, Virginia, et cetera. I mean, that, 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 sort, of, uh, that sort of line. But actually, I'm more interested in sort of some of these um, 
these national proximities, right? Because this is about sort of the American South and states and then British empire. And then uh, just to give you another example, at the other end of the Caribbean, it's really quite interesting. Um, the Dutch have the ABC islands, um, uh, Aruba, uh, Bonaire and Curaçao. And Curaçao is a major slave trading hub for the Dutch. But Venezuela, which is only 25 miles away, uh, or the ma a major city, um, or small city, um, abolishes slavery in the early 1850s. And there are these reports of all of these Dutch um, slaves crossing from Curaçao into Venezuela because it's free soil. Other examples are uh, Uruguay, um, which borders southern Brazil, uh, passes um, uh, or ab abolishes slavery. And slaves who are moved from the northeastern part of Brazil on de from declining sugar plantations to coffee, new spectacular coffee plantations in the south of Brazil, some of them decide to keep going south <laughs> across into Uruguay. Um, so, you know, I think that's really quite interesting. What does it say about the geography of freedom, uh, et cetera? And, you know, I, I've been, written a few articles about this, uh, um, and I'd like to sort of, um, I'd like to think about writing a broader book on it. Well, we'll look forward to, to seeing that, uh, Dr. Jeffrey Kerr Ritchie. Thank you so much again for a wonderful presentation. Um, and uh, to all our viewers, be sure to, Join us next month uh, for Ryan Smith and his discussion of Richmond Historic Cemeteries. But in the meantime, please take care. Thank you again for your support of the VMHC, and we'll see you all again next month. Bye-bye.